We're here today in the Center for Church Music speaking with Paul Westermeyer, recently retired professor from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, and a longtime uh, and longtime writer and thinker about matters, church music and hymnology in particular. And uh, he is here speaking at our lectures in church music where he gave the principal address yesterday morning and we'd like to have a conversation with him about matters, particularly matters hymnological. Welcome, Paul, to our conference room here. And uh, I'd like to ask you, one of, the in, one of the topics that you've spent a long time thinking and writing about has been the whole matter of congregational song. And yesterday you spoke particularly about Lutheran identity and its connection with congregational song. And you pointed to two uh, seminal publications in 1524, which happened to give shape to a Lutheran understanding and practice in hymnody and church music. And I wondered if you could just speak about that a little bit more and elaborate on that. Sure. 1524 uh, was the year in which a hymnal was published with eight hymns in it. So it's a choral book. Uh, for the congregation. In the same year was published a book of motets based on hymns for the choir. I mean, the, 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 the polyphonic motets are for the choir, but they're based on chorales. What that does is to signal for the Lutheran perspective, it seems to me, that hymns for the congregation and motets on hymns for the choir are hooked together intrinsically and the way they're hooked together is by alternation. Now I also said that I think the only way to make sense of that is to understand that it happens between 1523 and 1526 where there are two other publications. Luther takes the heritage he receives and he edits it, the worship heritage he receives and he edits it he edits it first in a Latin form, the form of the Missa. So you get the Mass of the Western Church uh, edited with uh, sacrifice removed, but it's still the form, shape, text of the Mass in Latin. And then the Deutsche Messe is in the vernacular, in German. And you, if you see the 1524 books nested between these other two, what you see is the congregational song and the choral alternation with it fit into the context of the whole church's worship, to use your words, in continuity with the whole church, the song of the royal priests. Well, that describes, the, uh, from one perspective, the, the, mu the musical forms that these, these took. Uh, what about the content of those songs? Uh, what, was their, what was their purpose, or what did Luther see as their purpose? Well, uh, as you would also say, I think, probably the center of the <laughs> Lutheran hymnological or hymnic being is proclamatory. You proclaim the message, and this is the song of the royal priests proclaiming the message. Now, as soon as you say that, you also have to understand that Luther talks about praise. And so you have praise and proclamation in a kind of circuit of sound. And behind that lies Luther's understanding that Music is this incredible gift. He cannot get over this incredible gift of music, which comes from the sphere of miraculous audible things, as Oscar Sungen says. And it's also next to the Word of God. It's next to theology as well, but it's next to the Word of God, which is a more profound sense than next to theology. And what that means is he figures out that you can use words, small w, to sing about the word, capital W. So this is an amazing reality that allows you then to voice the message of the gospel, to proclaim what God has done in Christ by words, which 
point to and express and carry the Word of God. Uh, the Box Cantata, a mighty fortress, I think, uh, says, how blessed are those who carry God in their mouths. That's a double meaning. We carry God in our mouths in the sense that we can proclaim the Word of God through words, but we also carry God in our mouths when we receive the body and blood of Christ in the bread and wine of communion. So it, somehow this whole proclamatory sense <coughs> tied to praise and the rest of, of the, the musical mystery, if you will, will is, is all put together here. An example of that would be Luther's familiar hymn, From Heaven Above to Earth I Come, where he takes the two phrases, singen and sagen, sing and say, right. uh, in the mouth of the angel, uh, from heaven above to earth I come, to bear good news to every home, uh, glad tidings of great joy I bring of which we now will say and sing. Right. And it was really like one concept, say and sing. Yes. Uh, it, it wasn't sometimes you say it, sometimes it was a kind of indissoluble thing. But going back to that first. Can we just start with some minute? Yeah. Say and say even means sing. Say and yeah. sing. They're very tied together. <laughs> Zager's book, The Gospel, The Proclamation, or whatever his title is, it um, says exactly the same mm -hmm. thing, exactly your point, mm -hmm. that these two are very, very closely tied mm -hmm. together for Luther. Yeah, sorry. And in that uh, first publication mm -hmm. in 1524 of the eight hymns, the very first hymn in that collection is the hymn, Dear Christians, One and well, All Rejoice, right. exactly. with exaltation springing and with united heart and voice and holy rapture singing, what? Proclaim the wonders God has done. Right. How his right arm, the victory won, and so on. And musically, it does the same thing. <laughs> There's a push from the beginning of the line, which is character, characteristic of the Lutheran crawls in their original rhythmic version, which I think is no accident. You can say it's partly cultural, but it's also theological. It, it relates to this proclamatory push that you get in the Lutheran tradition. In the Reformed tradition, there's more of a teleological tug from the end. Music is related to prayer. But here, if it's proclamatory, which does exactly what you quoted the text. Yeah, you were talking about the, the, the circular aspect of praise right. and, and proclamation. Uh, uh, it, I, I think one way that Luther could, would describe that is, uh, is that the way we proclaim, the way, when we proclaim the good news, that is the way God is truly praised. And when we truly praise God, we are, pro it's in through the act of proclamation. And that's what that first hymn says and many of the other hymns of the Reformation. Exactly so. Speak, yeah. speak that kind of language. One other thing you just mentioned, maybe you want to comment on this. When you use the phrase with Luther next to theology, which is a commonly referred to phrase next to theology, I give the highest place to music. Uh, we usually think of, we usually think of that. I believe in some kind of hierarchical pyramid character that there is theology is on the top and music is right under that. Uh, comes right after theology, and it's very important. It's next to the, but the phrase is next to it. And when you say, "I'm going to put these two boxes on the shelf next to each other," we mean side by side, not in some kind of a, a vertical relationship. And I think Luther would maybe uh, agree with that by saying that one sits next to each other, each one contributing its unique characteristics to the other. And that together, next to each other in the union of word and music, it becomes a third thing, which is that union. And uh, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I think, I think he means that. I think the next two in the sense of next to one another on a shelf or whatever, and then the, sim, uh, the symbiosis or whatever it is between the two. I think that's one thing. But I think it's also true that he somehow has in mind the quadrivium and the trivium. And when you get to the top of that, you get the music, and then when you have done those, the quadrivium and the trivium, you're ready to study theology. So there is some sense in which music is next to theology because it's a discipline of study that um, leads you to the theological task in some way. I think 
Um, that's not to say, I don't want to deny what you said about the two being next to one another, but I do want to say there is something here that's profound that theological establishments in our day somehow miss. Music is too hot to handle. It's too close to theological stuff. It raises all kinds of issues and it's ubiquitous. It relates to the whole life of the church and it's easier for theological establishments in our day just to avoid it and to, to assume it's some kind of a decorative patina. And I think Luther realizes that that's not the case. This is not just sort of decoration. This is essential stuff. Well, it, it, he's, he, he, in a sense, he, he grew up, of course, in the Augustinian tradition, and yep. Augustine was very nervous about about yeah, but that music said, could get out of bounds. Yeah, if of course, it's not of careful. course, and so was Calvin. But you realize what Luther also said: if Augustine were alive today, he would hold with us. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's right, and that's the way he served that. And, I, and, you, and you mentioned uh, his really his whole. Uh, preparation of uh, education in his life with the quadrivian trivia, uh, how that affected how he thought and, and practiced right, music. Right. What, just kind of explain a little bit. What what was his uh, training as a young man as he was growing up and through the priesthood and so on? Well, Mark Bangert would say that he probably um, glued on to the sense of music mm -hmm. in, or, or was trained with the sense of music out there in the spheres related to numerological issues. So you can see it, with, this is maybe how the organ developed, you, you know, in, in, there's no, there are no instruments in the church for the first thousand years in the east or west, still not in the east, but in the west, the organ gets introduced somewhere around a thousand, but maybe not for actual musical sound, but because you can see organ pipes and you can see one is half as long as another, and then you can see that that one sounds an octave higher than the other one. So you can see the true music, the true music which is what's out there in the spheres. Um, and Luther probably inherited, then what we do musically is a dim reflection of that. Yeah, which is no music that you can hear. Which is no music that you can hear because it's out there in the spheres, the true stuff spinning out in the spheres. Um, Mark Bangert's idea, I think he's right, um, is that Luther inherits that and probably still thinks that in a certain sense. But he and others, Oscar Zangen says the same thing. He wants to understand music as sounding form. This is not just a matter of some abstract stuff out there in the universe. This is sounding form, bodily. It fills time. Um, it fills space in a certain sense and that it fills our bodies, but it's not just somewhere else. It's among us and it carries the word and it does the same sort of thing you said on that circuit of praise and proclamation. I'm not sure that's an answer to your question. Well, but it, it's what, what it, you stimulate. It, 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 it's, it's part of what you're referring to is that transition in Luther's own thinking and speaking and writing from thinking of music as a kind of philosophical right. subject, moving into it as a practical art. Right. And, and in that sense, he, his whole history as a student uh, in, in schools and so on, where music was an essential part of what they yeah, were right. learning, right. and then as a priest in the daily office and right. so on, that he grew up with that kind of a background. Uh, it's, uh, one musicologist has said, uh, Luther grew up with music ringing in his ears. Yeah. Paul Henry Lang said that, and uh, that was what his whole background was, uh, that he, he was, a, in a sense, a, a person who was educated, who knew music, and who sang all his life in one way or another. Right. And I think he also <coughs> realized that that's the character of the music in the church. The music in the church is not only something you can think about, something theoretical, it's what actual human beings sing. And so when he, for example, realizes that the ordinary of the mass, which may have been sung by choirs primarily in the period just before him, when he realizes that the ordinary of the mass was sung by the folks, I mean, that's, th that's their 
stuff. He realizes that originally. And he also realizes, I think, that the congregation sings. I mean, Lysen, for example, as well. Um, somehow he has uh, um, a sense of the church's, what, your, your idea of the church's song in continuity with the whole church. It's not just some localized, I mean, he grows up with all of the his, music ringing in his ears, surely, but it's not localized only in his person or his period. I think he has this larger sense of the whole church and the whole church's song, and he imparts that um, creativity to Luth the Lutheran tradition that follows him, so we get this unbelievable flowering of hymn writers, text writers, and tune writers, hymn tune writers, and polyphonic writers, and everything, every kind of musical thing you can sense. Uh, I don't think that's possible to uh, understand, apart from Luther's uh, deeply uh, rich, deep understanding of the whole church's being as musical song. Yeah, in, in the uh, commonly sung hymn, which includes the phrase, through the church the, the song, song goes, goes on. on. And uh, uh, I, I, very, I very often I think we, we think that, uh, that here we are at St. John's by the gas station <laughs> and uh, we're singing, and isn't that nice that, as the preface reminds us, that the angels and archangels are singing right. along with us? No, Luther says, we're singing along with them. As Bonhoeffer says. Yes. Bonhoeffer and also picked well, up they on all, Luther's. They all say, everybody exactly. says. And, and this is a song then which we, in our time and space, are allowed to join in. Right, exactly. It's a song that was here long before we were here. Right. And it'll continue long after we're right. gone. Right. And, and we have that part. Well, so you now you refer to this this flowering of, of music which occurred in at least the first 150 or 200 years after Luther, which we it all It still know. occurs. You do it. Uh, well, it, it, it certainly occurred in that first... <laughs> yes, it Between did. Luther and Bach, it was yes. a great flowering. Yes. And, it, and the great amount of music that was written for chorus, chorus and eventually for organ and so on was, was all, for the most part, connected to those chorale melodies right. in large part. Right. And but then, uh, around somewhere in the 18th century, uh, it began to disintegrate. What, what? How did that work? Well, that's interesting how that worked, and I haven't ever completely <laughs> run it down. But you can tell that some things uh, clearly happened. Rationalism, where everything is related to reason. Pietism, where everything is related to feeling. And then finally in the 19th century, revivalism tend to work against this more Catholic heritage. And so the, the church in the 19th century had to figure out where do we stand? What are our roots? What is our identity? And um, part of the recovery in the 19th century was to rediscover the rhythmic chorale which obviously becomes a Lutheran symbol. It's not only to rediscover the Lutheran crawl, it's to rediscover the historic uh, traditions of worship uh, around word, font, and table, uh, prayer offices, and music as fitting in and functioning in those worship settings. It's not some kind, in the 19th century, well, 18th century into the 19th century, you get an oratorio tradition, uh, even go back with Handel, the beginning of oratorio, and then you get oratorio-like things in churches. So a Mozart mass, for example, the whole congregation turns around and watches the soprano on the balcony. And in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, both Salem and the Sicilian movement both say, wait a minute, something's wrong with this here. And the Lutherans also have the same sense, but then you have to recover somehow <laughs> what's going on in worship, not only what's going on in oratorio. And I, I'm not sure that we have still figured that out. I think we perpetually make category mistakes where we think that what's happening in worship is in fact oratorio. Or, oratorio has its place, but it's not participatory. 
Worship is participatory. And so against the ravages of rationalism, pietism, mm -hmm. revivalism, and then the, the musical oratorio tradition of the 19th century especially, the Lutheran Church has had to figure out what is participatory, what is it that we do at worship, and how do we do it, and what functions best, and, and, and how should we pursue this? You know, in the recovery, in that period of recovery, uh, end of the 19th century, in, in the middle end of the 19th century into the 20th century, when part of that recovery, as you mentioned, was the recovery of the rhythmic chorale, when you read the writers who were involved in that, the, the recovery of the rhythmic chorale was not some, simply some archaeological. No, uh, it was it was a confessional right. statement of sorts exactly. because in that form they felt the chorale made its most vigorous and and uh, exactly uh, proper way of exactly. uh, of singing that, which had been at, at least softened by the use of equal note chorale right. melodies, right. Uh, of which. Of course, the chorales of Bach are right. a good example of what comes yeah. out of that period. And so uh, it's interesting that today, by, in today's worship books among Lutherans, the rhythmic chorales are pretty much there. Yes. Whether the congregations all use those or not is another matter, but many of them do. But many do. And exactly. in, one, in one case, in the case of the, the Lutheran hymnal tradition of 1941, they always were there in, in right. one way or another. And uh, more uh, American Lutherans are beginning to see the richness and vitality of those, not just to energize singing, but as a kind of a confessional, c confessional statement. Of, right. uh, I, should, I think one should also say that, that they have influenced other traditions, but not with the same kind of confessional weight. And I think what you said before is really important. The recovery of the 19th century is not an archaeological dig, was not an archaeological dig. You had to do a lot of historical work to figure this out, but it has to do with roots and identity. It has to do with figuring out how the church lives the faith into this particular time and place. And that obviously relates in a Lutheran heritage to what has happened before, so you can't dismiss that. You have to figure all that out and be grateful for what your sisters and brothers have bequeathed to you. But it's not just to look back there and figure out, oh, isn't that interesting because we did some archeological stuff and we found this interesting little detail and now we're gonna just play with that for a while. It's not that at all. This is a, this is a broad-based <laughs> confessional understanding that, that relates to the whole church and figures out how to live the faith into its time and place. So in the same way that Luther saw congregational singing, right. strong, vigorous, unison congregational singing as, as a larger image of what the right. church is about, in the, uh, carried another step further, that rhythmic chorale was a, a kind of similar confessional. Right. Um, it made that, that point in a way that others didn't. It's been interesting time in, in my lifetime, at least in the the, from the middle of the 20th century till now, it's been a time, at least toward the middle, when the various denominations in this country were trying to s ask the question, on the occasion of their coming out with a new worship book, who are we as yes. Episcopalians, as Methodists, as Lutherans, whatever all. Right. And they were all, in various ways, forced to look at how does what we are evidence itself in the contents of our books and what we sing, right. and, and and so when you hark back to periods of rationalism and and uh, Pietism, uh, uh, I remember the the one uh, German hymn which was a reaction against much of the Pietistic hymnal, which saw validation for its faith in its feelings. In other words, I I know I'm saved right. because. I How feel, feel the spirit. Right. And, That's not and, too trustworthy. And, and the, the, the German hymn writer says, Ich glaube, was Gottes Wort verspricht. I believe and trust God's promises. Ich feel es oder feel es nicht, whether I feel it right. or not. Exactly. And, and so, uh, exactly. It, it's, uh, well, that, that's so, so where are we today? Where are we in the whole spectrum today when we are, uh, when the church is, uh, has a lot of stuff going on? Uh, I asked the question this way, is the glass half full for church musicians and hymnists? Is it half empty? 
Is it all full or is it empty? Where are we in all that today? Uh, interesting question. Um, first of all, let's go back to the books. Uh, all the books um, among American and Canadian Lutherans since 1888 Common Service have relied on the Common Service, which uh, figured out how to put together the, the materials that Lutherans had inherited. In the, and the service books and hymnals, it seems to me, have been quite responsible. And they have tried to figure this out in such a way that the materials of the heritage are there, the ones that are most usable. Obviously, uh, every generation has to, has to ferret out what you can keep and what you can't keep, but the stuff that's most durable is there. Plus, you try stuff from the culture. Uh, from the surrounding period and figure out how you put all this uh, together in such a way that, that uh, you can use it for our time and place. Now that's one thing that's been happening. There is um, another movement in all churches to get rid of hymnals altogether. And uh, we have split ourselves into pieces in alternative and traditional, which don't necessarily mean alternative and traditional. They sometimes flip meanings. It's very difficult to figure out what's going on. And uh, I, in the, in the Master of Sacred Music program that uh, I was the director of in, uh, at Luther Seminary, I've, all the students had to have church positions as part of their uh, curriculum, uh, fieldwork responsibility. I visited them all, and I visited a lot of other churches as well. And um, you can find anything. <laughs> you actually, you couldn't even invent everything that you can possibly find. One student, one of my students said to me, uh, please come and visit me soon because my pastor will not, will not plan anything. I said, oh, come on, that can't be true. She, she said, yeah, it's really true, come. Um, so I went, and uh, the pastor, this is a young, athletic human being, the pastor. But he could not walk across the chancel without tripping, and he could not read a sentence without screwing it up. And I realized everything was topsy-turvy. So I walked away from that service saying, well, that was interesting. This congregation did a pretty responsible Eucharist in spite of the pastor. And I've seen the same thing happen with music. The musician makes a botch of an introduction, and the congregation sort of says, you know, we're going to sing. You can do whatever you please. We're going to sing. So the congregation sings, and I walk away from <laughs> that service saying, well, now that was interesting. The congregation sang very well in spite of the musician. Now, of course, my musicians in, the, in my program never were like that. They always did wonderful work musically. Um, in any case, what I'm saying is everything seems to be going on out there uh, with all sorts of splits. And I don't know if glass half empty or glass half full is the way to describe it. I'd rather describe it like this. What the media portrays is always the conflict. So you get some sense of what's going on, but numbers trump everything. Numbers trump every other measure. And numbers and fights are what turn out to be on the front page of the paper and what the media portrays. Now, maybe it's always been that way, but the media is, in a certain sense, uh, more ubiquitous than it has been in the past, just given our technological uh, prowess. But um, in my sense is that virtually in every generation, you have some stuff that's going on that's probably not really very good. But then under the surface, there is this oasis of the church doing its job. So at the moment, the way I want to answer your question is, in every population area in this country, there are these wonderful oases where there are responsible pastors and responsible musicians who actually talk to each other 
and work together, who work with their congregations, and the congregations sing around word, font, and table. That is not publicized, but it is going on out there. And now I have to say, I can walk into a church, and I can't quite figure out how this is the case, but from what the congregation begins to sing almost immediately, I can tell what the relationship is between the congregation and the pastor. And it's a question of health or lack of health. And um, somehow the church, it's like a grain of mustard seed under the surface. In spite of all the other stuff that's going on, the church still sings. So I want to say trust the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you use the phrase uh, uh, mustard seed as just a tiny little thing. The, the other images, of course, it only takes a, a, just a, a small light to lighten the darkness or a little bit of leaven. Right. But that all, the mustard seed also is always growing. This is always a growing movement. And so this should be a, an encouragement. I would oh, think great. Church, I am very much encouraged. Exactly. Uh, it, 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 maybe you're <clears> in, in some isolated pl place, but when you're doing your thing what ought to be done regardless of what anyone else is doing I, we kind of forget that we point to Bach sometimes as the great Lutheran church musician he, he lived he his whole life in a very subs uh, circumscribed area and in some respects and, beaten up like uh, other uh, church uh, musicians yes right. and, and thrown into jail at the time <laughs> over <laughs> right. these matters right. and got into <clears throat> arguments with his right. pastor and all well that. except not the pastors as much I mean, it seems he got along mm. pretty much with his pastors but his, the authorities, the city well, the authorities. Well, the council, the city council. Right, the city or, council. Or, or, right, right exactly. Well, one of the aspects of, of a congregational song, which I just want to touch yet, a touch upon yet, is a, a congregational repertoire of song. Yep. Now, every congregation has a repertoire. Uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Uh, how does one, or, or how does one go about strengthening that repertoire in appropriate ways and how does that reflect or not reflect in terms of Lutheran congregations a Lutheran identity what does that mean for them okay the first thing I want to say is about any given tradition it is extremely important for that tradition to embrace it and to realize that this is our heritage and what we can sing and we do it not for ingrown reasons, but we do it as a gift to the whole church and world. And we do our thing very well. Now, the second thing to be said is that you can't only do your tradition in an ingrown way so that it becomes dead and idolatrous. So, of course, you take other stuff from other traditions, and what musicians do is with their ear hear these things, like Schutz goes to, to Italy and studies and figures out, isn't this interesting if we put these two things together? So there's a juxtaposition of things that go on um, in, in a church if it's doing its, its job well, it seems to me, but it is taking its tradition very seriously and not perpetually attacking it. It seems to me every one of our denominational heritages at the moment loves to make fun of itself. It's a deadly game which is destructive, self-destructive, and wrong. We need to take seriously our traditions and sing them well with, of course, other things like global song and all the rest of the things we have around. Now, to answer your question directly, what about, how, how do you take stock of this particular place? First of all, it seems to me, you say, it is in this place, but is it, it is in this place as part of the whole. It's not an isolated fragment, as you said before, it's in this place as part of the whole. So you figure out in, term, in continuity with the whole church. But you figure it out with this people. It's not any old people. It's this person and this person and this person and this person. And this particular group may or may not sing well. So you figure out how to help them sing whoever they happen to be. And then you also take stock of what you have sung and what you have not sung, and you can make a trajectory of this when you, keep, when you chart it. And you ought to have sung 
the whole story across the church year. Which is to say, you can't sing everything with five tunes. Now, how many hymns and tunes you can have depends upon the capacity of your particular congregation. It's probably more than we think, but probably in some cases it would be, one person told me once, his congregation could do 20 tunes. I doubt if it was that little. It probably could be more than that. Some congregations could do 200. <laughs> My particular congregation at the moment wants me to do a forum on the hymns we have not sung. We have the Evangelical Lutheran Worship, uh, that hymnal, and uh, we've sung a lot of stuff, and we sing all kinds of stuff out of it, but they want me to do one on the hymns we have not sung, which is very interesting, because they want to figure out what else we might sing, but, but they can do almost anything. Uh, that's my particular congregation. It's a wonderful place. Here's what I've also discovered. Congregations that sing psalm tones seem to be able to sing all kinds of other stuff. Psalm tones a cappella seem to be able to sing all kinds of styles. Congregations that can't sing or don't sing psalm tones, and pastors who don't allow us to sing psalms uh, need to be talked to. Um, Congregations that don't sing psalm tones don't seem to find their voice in the same way. Which is to say, there is a certain very, very simple congregational genre at the heart of congregational song. And once the congregation discovers it, its voice, it can sing way more than one would think. Last comment. Musicians are called to help it sing, not to destroy the song. That means we need to apply all of our musical expertise to the congregation's singing as well as to all the art pieces that we do outside of the church or in the church or wherever. That is to say, tempo, breath, pulse, all the, the kinds of things, the nuances of phrasing, the nuances of stretching and releasing and so on, all those things need to be part of the church musician's way of going at the congregation song, the same as every other piece. And it is very, very possible to help congregations <laughs> that are not singing, sing. I went to one church and said to me, Will you come and be our cantor? We don't sing very well. Would you help us sing? Sure, of course I will come. And we were not the Robert Shaw Corral, but we sang very, very well. Yep. Paul Westermeyer, it's been a delight uh, talking with you today, and we hope to continue this conversation in, in the future. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Carl. It's good to be with you. <laughs>